Good evening. It's 8 o'clock in Yerushalayim. This is webyshiva.org, and it's time to begin our regular series of shiurim in halacha. Our topic for this series is fun, and what the poskim, what the great rabbinic authorities have to say about having fun. Before I begin with the material, let me make some introductory comments. For those of you who are new to the Web Yeshiva, welcome. For those of you who are returning to the Web Yeshiva, welcome back. These shiurim are all recorded, and if you cannot participate live in one of the classes, you can always pick it up on the archive. The archive is available through the webyeshiva.org internet site, and the archives are available around 24 hours or so after the class is completed. If you want to ask me a question about something in one of the archived classes, feel free to send me an email. I'm going to type my email address on chat. There you have my email address on chat if you want to send me a question about one of the archived classes. If you want to ask about one of the classes live while we are all participating in this experience together, uh, you can uh, click the raise hand button and I can turn on your microphone or what most participants find mo far more convenient is just to ask your question on chat. If you ask the question on chat, I will see it appear on my screen and then I'll be able to incorporate the answer into the continuation, into the continuation of the class. I know that not all of you are from English speaking countries and if you find it easier to type a question in another language. Uh, uh, se puede hacer preguntas conmigo también en español. On peut poser des questions uh, même en français. Uh, man kann fragen auch auf Deutsch stellen. There are a number of languages, other languages, which I can handle. If you want to, to communicate with me in a different language, let me know. Maybe I can handle your language as well. Okay, that's introductory material. Now let's begin looking at the uh, sources. Let's begin looking at the texts. The things that we're going to want to figure out, if I can get this nice on the screen. There we go. Uh, the things which I'm, uh, the things which we, which we want to figure out are as follows. Number one, we want to know the definition of fun in rabbinic terms, the way the rabbis define the concept. And, and in addition to defining the concept, we're of course going to want to know what they tell us is permitted and prohibited. Uh, the, the, that, that, that's the thrust of any halachic discussion, defining the ideas and then figuring out exactly uh, what is permitted and what is prohibited in that framework. Now here we, we begin with a cultural problem. You know, every culture has its own language. In, in, in England, they speak English. In France, they speak French. And, and where there are cultural differences, the, the, those cultural differences are often, not always, often reflected in the language. And therefore, and therefore studying language is often, but not always, a window to the culture of the people who speak that language. When we speak amongst ourselves uh, uh, and we want to use Torah concepts, uh, halachic concepts or Torah concepts, we amongst ourselves always use Hebrew words or, or Yiddish words instead of the standard English words because of the differences in culture. Uh, among ourselves, we don't speak about going to the synagogue to pray. Among ourselves, we speak about going uh, to shul, to daven, or, or, or for tefillah. The, the reason that we prefer to use the Hebrew word or, or, or the Yiddish word is because of the cultural differences between the speakers of English for whom prayer has a certain cultural connotation to it, very different from the cultural connotation which we Jews have in tefillah. And since there's a difference in culture, uh, we, we feel uncomfortable. In using, in using the English word in situations like that. Well, as far as fun is concerned, the Hebrew language does not have a word for fun. Uh, 
uh, Israelis today, where they want to to say something about having fun, use an Arabic word for the purpose. Kef, kef is an Arabic word which is commonly used in Israeli Hebrew uh, to mean fun. Oh, that was a lot of fun. Zehaya uh, kef. But, but in Hebrew, there is no good word for fun, which leads us to the initial thought that maybe, maybe the idea of fun is foreign to rabbinic thinking. If, after all, uh, they, they were thinking about the idea, if they had thoughts about the idea, why did they not have a word uh, for fun? So our, our initial thought is that it's going to be difficult to find sources in rabbinic literature dealing with fun. And, and indeed, it is difficult. Uh, the, the, idea, the idea is present, and we're going to see that it's present, but it's deeply embedded in the sources, and therefore we're going to have to dig fairly deep through the sources <coughs> in order to find the idea of fun and what the rabbis think about it. Um, uh, uh, let's, let, let's begin with speaking about fun in the context of mourning. If an immediate relative dies, a parent, a child, a sibling, a spouse, if an immediate uh, uh, if a family member dies, of course, we sit shiva, we have seven days. We have seven days of mourning. And during the seven days of mourning, the, the, the fun or simple, let's see exactly what it is that is blocked. Let us see exactly what it is you're not supposed to do during the mourning period. And that will be the beginning of a definition of fun. Okay, let, 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 let's see what the rabbis have to say about the period of mourning. Here goes. We're talking about mourning, avelut. Says in the Gemara, Amar of Papa. Rav Papa said, or well, all, all of my sources, which I give you uh, on the board, which you have also a link to download them if you wish, all the sources are direct quotations, word for word, unless I make a mistake, uh, they're intended to be word for word quotations from the Mishnah, the Gemara, the great medieval rabbis, the Rishonim, the great Acharonim, the great modern authorities, and, 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 and I bring to you only the really important sources. Uh, uh, I, don't, I don't take the time to bring the opinions of rabbis who are not very well known. I bring only the most influential, the heavyweight, uh, the heavyweight postkin, uh, the heavyweight authorities in this series. All of Papa. Rav Papa said in the Gemara, Tana, the Aval Rabasi, we learn in this uh, uh, halachic book called Tana Rabasi, we learn in this book about, about mourning, Avel a mourner, this is what we learn, Ovel, a mourner, lo yaniach tinok betocheko, a mourner shall not take a baby in his lap or in her lap. You can't take a baby in your lap while you are in mourning, while you are sitting shiva seven days after the death of an immediate relative. Why? The mitnesha mivio, because the infant, the, ba the baby, will bring you, lide schok, will bring you to schok, to some kind of pleasure, to some kind of happiness, a little bit of joy will come into your life if you take the baby on your lap. The nimza, and it turns out, misgana al habrios, it turns out that the people who see you doing that will think that what you are doing is misgana. People will think that what you are doing is, yeah, same rule for women. People will think that what you are doing is misgana. People will think that what you're doing is repugnant. What you're doing is exactly the opposite of what is consonant with mourning. What, you, what mourning is all about is sadness, and taking a baby on your lap is just the opposite of that. And anyone who sees you playing, uh, holding a baby, playing, enjoying the, a baby on your lap, well, that, that's just the opposite of what's supposed to be going on in the house of mourning when, a mel when, when an immediate relative died. Now, we're, we're going to see uh, the leniencies that, that are involved here. Of course, uh, of course, uh, the, 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 the young mother who has a baby in the house is, is, uh, is, of course, not blocked from taking care of her baby. But we'll see sources uh, dealing with young mothers and their babies in a moment. Yes, well, we'll see about nursing, uh, nursing the baby and, and taking care of the baby. That, that, that's going to turn out to be okay, and we'll understand why in a moment. Now, among the great Rishonim, the Maharam Mahar Mintz 
one of the great medieval authorities, Ashkenaz, uh, one of the great medieval rabbis, that says as follows, and, and, and these are his words. Talmud Torah, Hukiyo Mitzvah Gedola, everyone knows that learning Torah is a great mitzvah. And uh, those of us who are deeply engaged in the learning of Torah uh, uh, experience joy when we do that. Makom, nonetheless, Eino Asarat Toch Shiva. Nonetheless, the, the joy which comes from learning Torah is prohibited only during the first seven days of mourning. Even though the mourning period goes on for 30 days, for a whole year, the, 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 the simcha, the simcha, the rejoicing of le- involved in learning uh, 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 is only for seven days. Um, Harold Bloom, uh, the great literary critic, was once a teacher of mine. And he pointed out that understanding comes in different levels. Uh, uh, that is simple understanding of a subject, simple understanding of an idea, simple understanding of a concept, and there's deeper understanding, and even deeper understanding. The levels of understanding, as delineated by Harold Bloom, are as follows. The... Uh, um, simplest, uh, the simplest level of understanding is represented, is characterized by the feeling of happiness, the feeling of fulfillment, the feeling of contentment that you experience when you finally understand something. If you understand it, you feel a sense of contentment. That sense of contentment represents the simplest level of understanding. If you have a deeper understanding, a more profound understanding of an idea, a concept, uh, whatever it is you're studying, if you have a more profound understanding, not only do you experience the contentment of understanding, but you now have uh, the ability to explain it to someone else. The ability to explain an idea to someone else represents a deeper understanding of the idea. Uh, I might experience the contentment of understanding something but not yet have sufficient grasp to be able to explain it to someone else. Uh, When I have sufficient grasp of the concept that I can explain it to someone else, that, that that characterizes, that represents a deeper understanding of the idea. And the deepest understanding, the deepest level of understanding, according to Harold Bloom anyway, is represented by someone who not only experiences contentment in understanding the Tosafot or Rashi or Rambam or whatever it is, not only does he or she experience the contentment of understanding, not only can he or she uh, explain it to someone else, but the deepest level of understanding is characterized by someone who can ask a question undermining the idea if you can if you can detect the flaws in the idea that's the deepest level of understanding but 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 uh, uh, you see Harold uh, Bloom taught us and I think everyone would agree that understanding whether it's a Tosafot or a Rashi or a Rambam understanding something does create the experience of contentment in the person who finally understands it. And that's true. Wahavdil, Kama Alfa Havdalas, that's true. Whether we're talking about Torah or any secular issue as well. That simcha, that sense of contentment is prohibited during the seven days of mourning. Lo Matsina the Simchas Kiyu Mitzvah Golyan Isa in general performing mitzvahs might give you a sense of contentment. In general, performing mitzvahs might make you feel good. There is no reason to prohibit mitzvahs for someone in mourning. Of course, people who are, who are in mourning, of course, they fulfill mitzvahs. And it's, it's, of course, correct that they feel a, a sense of simcha, that they feel a sense of contentment when they do a mitzvah. Raksha, mitzvah, atzmo, mitzvah, simcha. The, the, the only mitzvahs 
that we block a mourner from, the only mitzvahs that we prohibit for a mourner are those mitzvahs where the, 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 the mitzvah itself is a mitzvah to rejoice. For example, eating and drinking at, at, at a wedding. Eating and drinking at a wedding is itself the simcha. The, 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 the mitzvah is to rejoice. Uh, we're not talking about the sense of contentment because you feel, fulfill a mitzvah. That's okay for the mourner. But where the mitzvah itself is to rejoice, those are the mitzvahs which we block for people in mourning. For example, eating and drinking at a, uh, at a wedding. Now, you know, let's begin to think about it uh, a little bit. If we begin to think about it a little bit, you'll, you will, you will, you'll begin to see here a little hint. You'll begin to see here a little direction of understanding what Simcha is all about. We see here a little direction, the beginning of a direction in understanding what rejoicing and contentment is all about. Uh, uh, there are, According to the Mahara Mintz and according to Rav Papa, we are talking here about actions, uh, deeds, things you do, forms of behavior, which anyone who sees you can see what you're doing. Taking a baby on your lap is something, is an action. It's a form of behavior. It's something which anyone can see. Uh, the Mahara Mintz talks about the prohibition of eating and drinking at a wedding. Well, that's, that's an activity. That's something you do. Simcha, the kind of simcha which the rabbis are talking about, is simcha which is not only an experience of the heart, not only an internal feeling, but what makes simcha simcha and therefore prohibited for someone who is in mourning are certain kinds of actions, certain kinds of behaviors which are themselves expression of, of simcha. And, and, and that, that is the problem. Let, let's continue with the Maharam Mamins. He says, The chen simcha bala mitzvah asa shiva, any action which speaks of simcha, even though it's unrelated to a mitzvah, any action which speaks of, of simcha is prohibited for a mourner. A mourner does not take a baby on his or her lap during the seven days of mourning because taking the baby on your lap, when people see that, they will see you acting in a simcha way. Similarly, if it's uh, uh, someone in mourning for the death of their father or mother, should not go on a business trip. I, I don't know if you know businessmen. I, I, I live uh, I live in a, a community where there are not many businessmen, but, but uh, many businessmen enjoy their business immensely. They, they wake up in the morning and they look forward to going to their place of business in order to deal and buy things and sell things. And, and their business is a great pleasure. And many people find great pleasure in their business. You know, hopefully, hopefully people, you know, that, that's a good situation. It's true with many people. But that, that's, that's an example of simcha without any particular mitzvah associated to it. Well, people who demonstrate their enjoyment of business are not allowed to engage in business during the seven days of mourning. As long as, as the simcha is only in the heart and not visible to people who see you, it's not an action which demonstrates simcha. It's only an internal feeling no problem at all. The Torah has no interest in regulating your internal feelings and your internal thoughts. If the person who is in mourning for sitting shiva for the death of an immediate relative experiences in his heart something which makes him happy, so, 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 so be it. Uh, so be it. There, 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 there's no reason why the Torah should. There's probably no reason why the Torah can prohibit the experience of simcha in the heart, but actions 
deeds, your behavior, that is something which halacha can regulate, and, and behaving in a way that demonstrates simcha, that is wrong for someone who is supposed to be in mourning. Let's, let, let's look at what the modern contemporary poskin have to say about this. We have on the screen the words of the Gesher Achayim. Gesher Achayim was written by Rav Yechiel Michal Tokachinsky, the great Rosh Hashiva of, uh, of Eitz Chaim here in Yerushalayim. He was a, a friend and close colleague of Rav Kook back in the days, back in the days of Rav Kook, shortly before the founding of the state of Israel and shortly after the founding of the state of Israel. He, he, he was one of the great rabbinic authorities of Eretz Yisrael. And he wrote this book, Gesher Chaim, that we're about to quote from. Uh, this book we're about to quote from, Gesher Chaim, is, is one of the single greatest halachic works of modern poskim. The, the, the book deals entirely with avel, Avelus, the laws of mourning from beginning to end, and it's a, it's a work of, uh, it's, a, it's a masterpiece. A master. Let's see what he says about our issue. First, he quotes the Gemara that we already saw. Amar Rav Papa, Rav Papa said, you can't take a baby on your lap because if you bring, take a baby on your lap, it's going to bring you to Simcha, and the, the people who see you doing that will find this to be a repugnant activity. People who, are, who should be crying for the death of their, of their relatives should not be playing uh, with babies. Uh, uh, that's what Rav Papa said in the Gemara. The words are quoted again by the Gesher Chaim. Now, 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 now he, he begins his, his analysis. He says, Why did Rav Papa say that the reason that you're not allowed to take a baby on your lap is that people will find it repugnant? People will find it improper that someone who is in mourning does something uh, joyful like that. Well, why did he add that explanation? Why did he add the reason that, that you can't take the baby because people will find that action repugnant? Why did he add that reason? Uh, typically, uh, why didn't he simply say that the reason you can't have a baby on your lap is because that's simcha, that's rejoicing, it, it, it's fun, people enjoy it, people like playing with babies. Uh, why do you need to add this reason? Because the people who see you will find it repugnant. Hello. The explanation is, Simcha, which is prohibited for mourners, joyfulness, fun, which is prohibited during the seven days of mourning is an act, is an activity, an action. It's an action, it's an activity which people can see. When people see what you're doing, your actions speak of joyfulness. Uh, whether you have joyfulness in your heart or, or don't, the, the, the Torah cannot regulate that. But the halacha does regulate your actions and you should not behave in a joyful way during, uh, during the seven days of mourning. And if you will say that internal experience of simcha is permitted for a mourner, then uh, what's the problem with learning Torah? That learning Torah creates an internal feeling of contentment. Uh, or if, if, if the only rejoicing which is prohibited, the only fun which is prohibited, is fun which people see the way you're acting, then, then, then why is Torah, why is Talmud Torah, why is learning Torah prohibited? If that's only an internal feeling of simcha, only an internal feeling of rejoicing. Ketzat uh, Yeshloma, we should say, since Talmud Torah involves speaking out the words, 
uh, uh, nowadays, we are accustomed to read silently. We are taught to read without moving the lips. That's a very recent development in human history. Uh, until, quite, until quite recently, reading was always done out loud. If you think about it for a moment, you realize that the Hebrew word to read is likro, which really means to call out loud. Right? Likro, the basic meaning is to call out loud. Reading was always done out loud until really quite recently in human history. Talmud Torah is an action which anyone who sees you will realize that you're rejoicing. They will hear the words of Torah you are saying. They will hear the intonation of your voice. They will hear the intonation of your voice change the moment you have that flash of understanding and you will expose your simcha to anyone who can hear you. So this is the way the Gesher Chaim explains things. Now one thing is perfectly clear. The, the, the hint in the in the Gemara and the hint in the Mahara Mints and the medieval authorities that Simcha is a form of behavior that anyone can see if they look at you or hear, if they listen to your speech. That idea which was a hint in the Gemara with taking the baby on the lap, that idea which was a hint in the Mahara Mints in the medieval sources, that idea becomes an explicit idea among the great contemporary rabbis, the simcha, the rejoicing, the fun, which the rabbis speak about, is not an internal experience, but rather a form of behavior which anyone who sees you will perceive and interpret as being uh, an act of joy. Of joy. Now, uh, if, if you think about it for a moment, you will further realize that this idea is probably inherent, this idea seems to be inherent in a very important verse in the book of Psalms in Sefer Tehillim. Uh, there's a verse in, in the book of Psalms in Sefer Tehillim, Az pinu, then our mouths will be filled with rejoicing. Uh, the, the verse in the in the book of Psalms does not talk about an internal simcha of the heart. The verse talks about a kind of simcha, which is a form of behavior, speech in this case, which anyone who hears you will understand that you are rejoicing. Simcha in the rabbinic sources, which we have seen up till this point, we're presently going to see other sources, but up till this point, the simcha, which we've seen in rabbinic sources, is always a kind of activity, a form of behavior, which anyone who sees you will interpret as being an expression of, uh, of simcha. And, uh, the, uh, we just quoted the Gesher Chaim, Rav Tukachinsky, one of the heavyweights of modern rabbis who expressed this idea very clearly. Uh, we can see the same idea in Rav Zonenfeld's writings, the, the Simlas Chaim that we're about to look at, written by Rav Chaim Zonenfeld. Rav Chaim Zonenfeld was the head of the Eda Haredit in Me'er Sha'arim, in, uh, in Yerushalayim, in Jerusalem, back in the days of Rav Tokachinsky, back in the days of Rav Kook. And being the head, the chief Dayan, the head of the Eda Haredit, put him at the very pinnacle of the, uh, of the Torah uh, of the rabbinic world in, uh, in, in, in those days, he too was quite influential. Let's see what he says about our issue. Apostle, it's obvious. The likach tinok betoch heko vaday mote. Of course, there's no prohibition for people in mourning to hold babies on their laps. Uh, of course, of course, young mothers can, can nurse their babies. And of course, uh, young parents, uh, fathers, uh, or fathers or mothers uh, can take care of their babies' needs. Babies need, uh, need need to be changed. They need their diapers changed. They need to be carried. They need to need to be comforted uh, when they're unhappy. You have to carry them. You have to hold them. Anyone who's had a baby knows about this. Um, of course, that's permitted for someone in mourning. And now, now when he just told us, uh, of course, it's permitted for a mourner to hold a baby on his lap seems to fly in the face of all of the sources we've seen from the Gemara on down, but, but, but he's going to explain 
why it's okay. So what you have to be careful about, he says, what you have to be careful about is not to engage in activity, not to engage in behavior which demonstrates your simcha. If, if you're holding the baby to comfort the baby, fine. If you're holding the baby, holding the baby in your lap to nurse the baby, fine. If you uh, if you have the baby be, uh, holding the baby because you want to change the baby's diaper, fine. There is no there is no prohibition in handling babies and dealing with babies when you're sitting when you're sitting with a prohibition. What you have to be careful about is doing activities which will demonstrate your simcha to anyone who sees you. Imke, therefore, be'etzem enkan iser elashet sarich lizaher harbe shelo yavei lizaher. There's no essential prohibition in in holding babies. The, the prohibition is demonstrating simcha to people who see you. Uh, of course, most people, uh, when they, uh, most ordinary people, when they hold babies, will demonstrate some simcha. Most uh, people, when they hold babies, will reveal their rejoicing, and people will notice that. Uh, that's a that's a normal that's a normal reaction. Surely, surely, if I hold uh, one of my grandchildren. Uh, in the arms of people, people see that I'm very happy about it. Uh, it's the expression of simcha which is wrong. Uh, that's what people think is wrong. That's what people correctly think is wrong if they see you rejoicing while you're supposed to be uh, mourning for, for for the deceased. Well, well, we're just building up more and more sources, more and more proof that simcha is a form of behavior, it's an activity, which anyone who sees you will interpret as meaning that you are rejoicing. It's not an internal, not an internal feeling of the heart. Now, the Orach HaSholchan, we feel Michael Epstein, the great Rav of Nevardek, uh, hundreds of hundred years ago in, uh, in Lithuania, uh, this is my my favorite book in Halakha. I, uh, I hope I'm entitled to have a favorite sefer. This is my favorite, but uh, even for people who, uh, who who would not say it's their favorite, surely everyone would have to agree that it's one of the most important works of the Achilon of the great modern rabbis. This is what he says: Schok kan ken ketzat simcha. There's schok, a little bit of of joy, and simcha, a lot of joy. But uh, these are two two places on the spectrum of rejoicing, schok and simcha. Simcha a greater level of rejoicing, uh, schok a lower level. Einek uh, simcha mamish. The lower level is not really uh, so powerful. Ein la'asa rak betok shiva. The lower level schok is prohibited only during the seven days of mourning. Va schoku hefech merbechia. Schok. The, the, the rejoicing, which is prohibited here, is the opposite of crying. What's supposed to be happening during the seven days of mourning? What's supposed to be happening is crying, not necessarily tears coming out of the eyes, but people who see you realize that you are not happy. That's what's supposed to be happening during the seven days of mourning. People who see you can tell by the way you act, by the way you behave, that you are not happy, whether you, whether you actually have tears coming out of your eyes is not the point. All of that is called crying. And that's what the verse says. In the book of Kohelet, there's a time to cry and a time to rejoice. The seven days of mourning is the time to cry. Lachem, b'shiva, therefore, during the seven days, when habechi matsui, during the seven days of mourning, when you are supposed to be acting, you're supposed to be be behaving in a way that demonstrates your sadness, so you cannot behave in a way that demonstrates your joy. Uh, this applies only during the seven days of mourning. Okay, uh, we have here a new level of understanding, which the Orach Shulchan has added to the discussion. Now, first of all, he reinforces 
the idea that we've seen over and over again, that Simcha is a form of behavior, a form of activity, which demonstrates joy, which demonstrates that you're having fun. And it was added another terribly important point. These activities, these forms of behavior, which demonstrate to anyone who sees you that you are having fun, these fun activities are prohibited during the seven days of mourning. Not during the subsequent 30 days, not during the subsequent year, and surely not beyond the, uh, beyond the year of mourning. It follows, therefore, that shok, experience, uh, shok activities which demonstrate that you're having fun are fine. There's no halachic objection to them whatsoever, except during the seven days of mourning. Seven days of mourning is a time you're not supposed to be having fun. Other times, even during the 30 days, even during the year of mourning, surely beyond the year of mourning, when you're not in mourning at all anymore, uh, there is uh, apparently, according to the Orcha Shulchan, no objection at all in engaging in activities which are activities of fun. That's a limitation specifically on the seven days in the morning. Well, 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 we've learned a lot so far. What we've learned so far is the internal experience of contentment. The internal experience of simcha is, is always uh, correct and acceptable. Acting in a way that demonstrates that you're having fun, acting, behaving in a way that demonstrates that you are experiencing simcha, that is blocked during the seven days of mourning. Beyond that, no problem at all. That's a big, uh, a big uh, uh, conclusion of great importance. Let's go one step further. Uh, Videsh Rachayim, whom we introduced before, uh, says in another place in the same book, he quotes the, the Orach HaShulchan that we just saw on the previous screen, and after quoting the Orach HaShulchan that we just saw on the previous screen, uh, he, he disagrees with him. Uh, and he says as follows, Indian schok hurak kishinishma labriyot. Schok, rejoicing, which is prohibited during the seven days, is only an activity which can be perceived by other people. And that's what the Gemara meant when it said, the only day schok, nimtzim is gana alabrios. That's why the Gemara said you can't take a, a baby on your lap. The Gemara said the reason was, Rav Papa said the reason was because people will see that you are rejoicing. Aval panim smechim v'sochakim, just smiling. In ze bechlal isur, that's no prohibition at all, even during the seven days. Unlike the Orach HaShulchan on the previous screen, who said a smiling face demonstrates that you're having fun, our author now, the Geshe Chaim, says even a smiling face does not demonstrate that you're having fun. Many people will smile through agonizing activities. He might hate the performance that he's forced to sit through. Nonetheless, he'll smile politely. Just because people are smiling does not necessarily reflect the inner simcha. According to the Orcha Shulchan on the previous screen, simply smiling is prohibited. According to the Geshe Rechaim, no, people don't necessarily interpret a smile as meaning that you're having fun. It might just mean that you're polite and, uh, and not actually having fun. In order to, to really demonstrate that you're having simcha, just smiling is not enough. You actually have to do something with some form of behavior beyond just smiling. Uh, well, let's finish now uh, with the words, words of the Geshe Rechaim. These are still the words of, um, of Rav Tokachinsky. Uh, when I add my own comments, like on the bottom of the current screen, I was doing a different typeface. The, the, the block letters are always direct quotes from the words of the great rabbis. Uh, maybe, maybe our author, the Geshe Rechaim, says, there's a different point to be made here. After it's possible, 
שאומנם כן, גם שחוק, גם שמחה, כשהוא שוחק ושמח לבדו, לא אסור לו, כנדי ביטרו, that personal, private, individual joy, personal, private, individual fun, is never prohibited, even for someone in mourning during the seven days, all the more so uh, for ordinary people. כל מה שמצינו שעשו, כל שלושים, י' בי סטודש, all of the examples of prohibitions which we find in the Mishnah and Gemara and all the rabbinic sources, all the examples of prohibitions which we find because they represent fun, אמרו בלשון, they're all formulated in terms of בית השמחה. You can't go to the house of rejoicing. That's what the, that's what the Gemara says. You shouldn't go to a wedding when you are in mourning. The Gemara says you shouldn't go to Beit HaSimcha, to the house of rejoicing. Beit HaMishteh, you shouldn't go to the house of drinking. That's where, uh, a drinking party where they're drinking wine and rejoicing. Su'udat Mure'ut, you shouldn't go to a festive meal where people are, are eating together. And rejoicing, you can't even join a caravan. Now you guys don't know much about caravans because you don't live in the Near East. Well, you and I who do live in the Near East, we don't have caravans anymore. But back in the good old days, when there were caravans in the Near East, if you wanted to get from Damascus uh, to Jerusalem or from Jerusalem to Baghdad. If you wanted to travel, you needed a caravan. The reason you needed a caravan was because the deserts in those days, or they still are, uh, the deserts in those days were dangerous. There were thieves. There were murderers. It was simply dangerous to travel through the, through the d- deserts in those days. And therefore, you had to travel with a caravan to have safety in numbers. And, and, and when those caravans went, from Jerusalem to Baghdad, from Baghdad to Damascus, when the caravan uh, went out, that was so so helot, there was rejoicing, singing, it was a it, it was a, a, a great event. Well well joining the caravan while you are in mourning, that's singing and dancing and music and that that's a great jubilation. It, it, it's 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 an activity, it's a behavior which demonstrates simcha to anyone who sees you. All the examples of, of, of prohibited rejoicing, all the examples of prohibited fun during the seven days of mourning for, for anyone who is in availus, anyone who is in mourning, are all specific forms of behavior access, nothing to do with what's going on in your heart. Uh, someone participating in the, uh, in the caravan might truly be sad of heart, uh, might be depressed for any number of quite justifiable reasons, and he, he's, he's very sad because something very sad happened. Nonetheless, just participating in the caravan demonstrates simcha. He might not have simcha in his heart, but it sure looks that way based on the way he's behaving. Someone who goes uh, to the beta simcha, to the wedding hall, where people are singing and dancing and eating and rejoicing, uh, he might in his heart be very sad for who knows what reasons, what perfectly justifiable reasons, because something very sad happened. But just going to the wedding hall where the, where the rejoicing is taking place is an action that speaks of simcha, whether it's in the heart or not. The halacha does not look at what's going on in your heart. It looks at your actions. Keshehu levado. If you are in private by yourself, Samech or Sachek, and you're happy, you smile, you rejoice, well, what's in the Ferush Lisa? We never found any reason, we never found any source to prohibit that. We never found any source to prohibit private happiness. We never saw any reason to prohibit private fun, even during the seven days of mourning, all the more so. Uh, outside of the seven days of mourning. After uh, Shagam lo matzati heter ze b'shum posek v'shiru achador shalom, sending gifts, uh, greeting people, 
all kinds of things uh, are, are mentioned in the in the sources. Bottom line, and here are the important words. Bottom line, note da'ati. Bottom line, uh, I tend to believe shasimcha asa lav dafka bekinus. I tend to think that what's prohibited is a public display of behavior which people will interpret as being behavior of simcha. Okay, what we have up till now is uh, uh, some very powerful, a few very powerful ideas which, uh, which we have to keep in mind. Number one, there's surely no objection to an internal feeling, an internal experience of having fun, even during the seven days of mourning, more the, all the more so during the rest of your life. And, and, and even during the seven days of mourning, what is prohibited is not the internal feeling, the internal experience of fun. It's behaving in a way that demonstrates to anyone who sees you that you are having fun. Uh, merely nursing the baby, merely changing uh, the, the baby's diaper, merely holding the baby, rocking the baby, carrying the baby to comfort it so that it will uh, be calm and, uh, and, 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 and happy. Well, I, these are not expressions of simcha. These are expressions of taking care of a baby. On the other hand, if you play with the baby in a way that demonstrates that you're having fun, that's a problem during the seven days of mourning. Uh, not for the rest of your life. Okay, uh, it follows, therefore, that in general, fun is prohibited. Uh, uh, so far, we have not a whiff. So far, we have not the slightest hint of an idea that there's any positive value in fun. All we've seen so far is that there's no prohibition. The fun which is prohibited is the perception of others during the seven days of mourning. Uh, during the rest of your life, it's fine if people perceive that you're having fun. And, and even during the seven days, if it's only internal, private, and personal, it's also okay. Uh, up until now, we've said that fun is okay. It's permissible except for expressions of fun during the seven days of mourning. But, mourning, but up till now, all we've seen are, uh, are a pile of proofs that uh, there's nothing wrong with having fun. But we've not seen any uh, positive endorsement. We've not seen anything good about it, anything advisable, anything recommendable. Uh, 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 all we've seen so far is that it's permitted, but not something to be advised or recommended. Correct. Certain activities of fun are disrespectful to the deceased. That's the whole problem. Beyond that, there's no problem at all during mourning, and if there's a, and all the more so, uh, no problem during the rest of your life. Okay. Well, let, 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 let's now embark upon the uh, upon the issue of seeing whether or not there are any sources which actually speak positively about having fun. Is there some positive values? Is there some reason to, uh, to recommend it, to advise it? Is, is, is it good? Or is it only neutral, as we've seen up till now? Let's begin with a quote from the, from the Shulchan Aruch. Uh, at first, you're not going to understand what this has to do with the issue, but at the end, you'll, you'll see how it's directly connected. Uh, the Shulchan Aruch says, I don't have to introduce the Shulchan Aruch. Everyone knows it. This is Karo, early 16th century. In E.F. Sharlo Lilmod, if you find that you cannot study Torah effectively in the afternoon, below Shnat Zoharayim, without taking a nap, you know, you get to my age and you begin to run out of energy in the late afternoon and you can't learn Torah or engage in mitzvahs very effectively because you get tired and you want to take a nap. Okay, so, so if you find that you need a nap in order to, to engage vigorously in Torah and mitzvahs, you should go to sleep. 
If that's what you need, go to sleep, take a nap. If you need a nap, take a nap. That's what the Shavuot says. Dovad shalod ya'arichba. As long as you don't have a long nap. Just take a short nap. Just enough to refresh yourself. Why? She'asur lishan bayom. Asur lishan bayom. Yoter mishnat asus. Shushitin nishme. Because the Gemara says that uh, sleep, uh, sleep is prohibited during the day. You're only allowed to sleep at night. That's what the Gemara says. The Gemara says sleep is permitted only at night, not during the day. If you have to take a nap to refresh yourself during the day, a brief nap is okay, up to shnat hasus, up to the length of time that horses snooze. How long is a nap of a horse? Uh, uh, according to the Gemara, the nap, the brief sleep of a horse is shite nishme, 60 breaths. I don't know exactly how fast uh, uh, horses uh, breathe, but uh, when they're asleep, they breathe very slowly, and most of the posts can say we're talking here about 20 minutes or so, around 20 minutes, around a 20 minute nap. That would be the, the length of a nap, a brief sleep of a horse. That's okay during the day if you need it to refresh yourself. That's what the Shohan Aruch says. And even in this brief nap, even in this 20-minute nap, you should not have kavana, you should not have intention to enjoy the sleep. Well, what should your kavana be? What should your intention be? You should have in mind you should have kavana, you should have thoughts in mind that the reason you're taking the nap is not to feel better, not for your own enjoyment, not for your own pleasure. The reason you're taking the nap is for avoda Hashem, in order to be able to serve God better, in order to be able to do Torah and mitzvahs better when you wake up. Now, uh, uh, the idea here is the Shonar has specified one particular activity, namely sleeping, uh, which can be done for two different reasons. There can be two different motivations for sleeping. There can be two different motivations for taking a nap. You can take a nap because you enjoy it. It makes you feel better. On the other hand, you can take exactly the same nap for a different reason. The motivation might be because you want to be able to serve God better, Torah and mitzvahs, you'll be able to do better uh, later on. Now, 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 where the sleep is basically prohibited, mainly during the day as opposed at night, as long as you have the proper kavana, as long as you have the proper intention, then all of a sudden the sleep becomes permitted. Now, now, what you should be thinking of in the back of your mind, while the Shulchan Aruch, and presently we're going to see on the subsequent screens, more rabbis are going to be talking about sleep, but what you should have in the back of your mind are other examples. Although the Gemara, although the Shulchan Aruch and the post are talking about sleep motivated by, it's going to make me feel good, or sleep motivated by, it's going to enable me to do Torah and mitzvahs better, have in the back of your mind other activities. Um, forgive me uh, if my examples are all boy examples. I look at things from the boy's point of view. Uh, just substitute girl examples uh, if, if, if you want. What about playing basketball? Uh, is there any positive value in playing basketball? Well, uh, according to the Shulchan Aruch, sleeping during the day all of a sudden turns into a positive, uplifting religious experience if your kavana, if your intention, is so that you'll be able to do Torah and Mitzvahs better. And now what about playing basketball? Uh, should the same idea apply? Apparently so. Uh, someone who takes an hour off to play basketball or any other enjoyable activity, if the reason you're doing it is in order to refresh yourself, if the reason you're doing it is in order to make yourself better and stronger so as to be able to return 
to Torah and mitzvahs with greater vigor and greater strength, just as the sleep is valuable from the Torah point of view, just as the sleep is something which is good from the Torah point of view because, because it will help you do Torah and mitzvahs, the same can be said with basketball or any other activity which is going to refresh you and, uh, and enable you to return later in the day to better fulfillment of Torah and mitzvahs. You know, there are people out there, a small handful of great tzaddikim, a very small handful of great tzaddikim, who are able to devote themselves to Torah and mitzvahs all their waking hours. Is a small number of great tzaddikim whose energy through all their waking hours is devoted entirely to Torah and mitzvahs. Well, there are very few such people in the world. Uh, most ordinary people like me run out of energy, run out of steam uh, as far as the performance of Torah and mitzvahs are concerned. Uh, and if I can relax for a while, uh, whether it be a uh, uh, game of basketball or, or napping in the afternoon, or whatever will enable me to refresh myself in order to return with greater vigor to Torah and mitzvahs later in the day. That, that's, not, that's not only neutral having fun, which we saw on the previous screens, is permitted. It's now turned into a positive experience, a religiously uplifting experience. The, 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 the the, the, the relaxation becomes part of the performance of Torah and Mitzvahs later. Shulchan Aruch goes on and says, This idea is true not only about sleeping, it's about everything in this world. You shouldn't do it only because of your own pleasure. You shouldn't do it, everything in this world. You shouldn't do be only because of your own enjoyment. You do it as part of, of serving God. And that's what it says in the verse in Mishlei. Know God in everything you do. Even if you're playing bridge, uh, even if you're uh, playing basketball, even if you're taking a nap, that can be part of knowing God if the reason you're doing it, if the motivation, if the kavana, if the intention is that you'll refresh yourself and be able to do Torah and mitzvahs with greater vigor later on. The Shulchan Aruch concludes by saying, Amu Chachamim, the, the sages say, and this is still a quotation from the Shulchan Aruch, Kol ma'asecha yi l'shem shamayim, everything you should do. Everything you do should be for the sake of heaven, whether it's picking up an etrog or eating matzah in Leil HaSeder or playing basketball or bridge or, 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 or taking a nap. Everything you, should, everything you do should be for the sake of heaven. Even things which are neutral, like having fun, which we've demonstrated quite thoroughly is just a neutral idea. If you're doing this a neutral idea, like having fun, Kegod, achila, shtiya, halicha, yeshiva, walking, sitting, hakima, tashmish, marital intercourse, sicha, v'chol tzorche gufcha, conversation with your friends, anything which your body needs, yiyu kulam la'avodas habore. As long as your intention, your kavana, is to serve God, even though you are quenching your thirst when you drink something you enjoy drinking, even though you do have enjoyment of your body, even though you do uh, satisfy your hunger when you eat something when you're hungry, even though you do have pleasure of your body, if you add to that the intention that you're doing it so that you will be able to serve God better, if you have the kavana, the intention, that it's to enable you to do mitzvahs better, it changes from being a neutral activity, even though you do enjoy it yourself, it changes from a neutral activity into a praiseworthy one, something that we can recommend. So, with this we come to the end of our first hour. Uh, in subsequent shi'ulim, we are going to explore many 
uh, many specific forms of fun uh, on Shabbos, on Yantif, uh, during the year, and so forth and so on. And we'll see exactly what the great rabbis have to say about having fun in many specific contexts. Until then, I wish you a good week and eventually a Shabbat Shalom and look forward to seeing you all again next week. Until then, Shalom Shalom.